In the unfolding drama of the Spice Isle's resilience, the courtroom becomes a stage where the human spirit confronts its darkest shadows. As the trial proceeds, the echoes of history resound, reminding us of the fragility of justice and the enduring power of truth. In the face of the solemn proceedings, the voice of the chief instigator reverberates, a testament to the complexities of human nature and the depths of human suffering. Through the lens of the journalist who dare to probe, we glimpse the paradoxes of resilience, where strength emerges from vulnerability and hope endures in the face of adversity. In this moment of revelation, we are compelled to contemplate the intricate tapestry of human experience, where resilience is not merely a response to the hardship, but a profound assertion of the human spirit's capacity to transcend. The short-lived reign of the RMC came to a dramatic end on the morning of October 25, 1983, when 500 airborne rangers and U.S. Marines landed at the Point Salines Airport at the southeastern point of Grenada. A very warm welcome to Resilience of the Spice Isle. I'm sure with McCaskey, as always, I'm pleased that you have joined us. Now, following the death of the revolution and the subsequent general elections in Grenada, Herbert Blaise has assumed the role of Prime Minister. In the face of these developments, the capture and ongoing trial of the Grenada 17 have put the nation on high alert. With a focus on national security, Prime Minister Herbert Blaise is actively seeking assistance to ensure the safety of the country, particularly in anticipation of potential retaliation due to the detainees awaiting trial. Now, this week's episode begins with then CBC's reporter Emmanuel Joseph, who provides insight into the current situation there in Grenada. Yesterday, Grenada's Prime Minister invoked the Regional Security System's Memorandum of Understanding and requested paramilitary reinforcements from fellow members of the RSS. The government wants to prevent any trouble that may be caused by sympathizers of the 18 former military and political leaders in Grenada, now on trial for the murder of Prime Minister Morris Bishop three years ago. The Grenada 17 would be the persons who would have been convicted for what happened on October 19th. There were 20 people at the beginning, 17 of them were convicted. Well, I remember they were taken out of where they were. Um, they were, um, in my opinion, I would use the word humiliated, um, having to, to sit in, in fenced areas. Um, there were reports that they were taken to one of the ships outside. And then they were, they were put in prison here. Um, as well. Uh, they, they stayed in prison until the trial started. As you drive to the prison, there's a building off to your right. That was the first building that used to be a hospital. The second building used to be what is called the Lions Den. It actually belonged to the Lions Club. And it used to be the scene of parties and, and those kinds of events. Once the preliminary inquiry and all that had taken place in preparation for a trial, that was transformed into a court because um, part of it was that they did not want to move these guys further from, from the prison. Um, I suspect auto security fares as well. I remember that uh, there were some, again, some contradictions in that situation because by this time there was elections. Herbert Blaise had won, 14-1, and the trial was due to start, but the parliament had then reverted to Grenada's constitution. They had, they had put Grenada's constitution back in place but they had kept the laws passed by the PRG to try these guys under, which, I, which was a contradiction to me, even from a journalistic perspective as well, because I'm thinking, if you've revived the constitution and you've ruled that these laws are unconstitutional, then how come you're using these unconstitutional laws to now try these guys who 
threw the Constitution away. Shouldn't he be trying them under the Constitution that they removed? So it, there were those kinds of inconsistencies. Um, I remember in some parts of the, of the I, I don't remember, for example, at any point where Bernard Cord's name was mentioned, actually having done anything or having to be implicated directly in anything. So they had, they had, they, had, they were trying these guys on these, these, these interesting laws. And I had an interesting, <laughs> again, being a young journalist, um, kind of thrown into the deep end to cover a trial, I've never even been to the courthouse before. Um, and in the preliminary inquiry, I actually gave out in one of my news stories what was actually said on the stand as a witness. And I remembered Justice Dennis Barron, who was one of the judges, actually calling me up in court, in open court, and saying, who's, who's Richard Simon, the, the, Caribbean, the Caribbean News Agency reporter? And very sheepishly and in actually total surprise, I kind of said I am, um, and everybody kind of looked in my direction, and he said, "Well, you've, we've we've heard your report and so on, and and, and you've you've just committed a crime, or something to that effect, because you've reported um, information to the public that is the preliminary inquiry, which um, which is closed, and all that." And, and I was kind of shaking in my boots. Carl Hudson Phillips actually said, um, "Judge, um, this is a young reporter. I know him well. He kind of vouched for me. Um, he did not mean any harm." and all the rest of it, um, and so I, I, I would like to, this one to just pass with a warning. The experiences of young journalist Richard Simon, who covered the trial and reported for the people. But what were the general experiences of that trial? It was a strange trial. The accused decided that they were not going to be part of the process. In fact, one of the chants they always chanted in court was kangaroo court, kangaroo court. They did, not, they did not respect the court, and therefore there, there was always some altercation. I remember at one point where they actually had to, for a while, suspend the hearing until um, the issues. I remember it was a long trial, and we had to go there quite, quite often. In the preliminary inquiry, one person, I think, was released because he was found to have not been directly involved in the execution of Bishop and, and his group. And then there was another, another gentleman who was also released for a similar reason, I think. But the entire group of 17, I think, was, was, was found liable um, for the death of, of Bishop and, and the others, and given various lengths of uh, sentences in, 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 in jail. In fact, Cord was, was one of the, those who were sentenced to um, quite a long period. Um, but the guys who pulled the trigger were kind of given lesser sentences because they were acting on command I also remember the very heavy security that you came in under. I mean, your tape recorders, you, you always had to write because I don't remember us bringing tape recorders into the, into the, the courtroom either. So you always had to be very clear on, on, on your note taking and be very cautious in what you were able to say. And what, what, what happened after that was um, my reporting kind of, I always, I always checked it with the court clerk or checked it with the, with the, with the defense or the prosecution lawyers to say, is this what you said? Um, and, and so it kind of helped me as a journalist to actually become a better journalist by always fact-checking um, the things I, I was going to report. Um, uh, but that was a, a, a very good learning experience. But I found that in my, my interaction with the persons who were now on trial, I had a, a, a great difficulty responding, reacting to them. These are people who I had known, right? These are people who I, who I had worked with um, in Radio Free Grenada. They were responsible for, from where I sat, two things. One is, people had great hope that the revolution was going somewhere. We were beginning to make our own juices, to manufacture things. As Bishop would have said, we were poor but we were proud. There's a sense that something was happening in the country um, for young people like, like myself. And because that did not pan out, I found it difficult to relate to the persons who I, I held responsible for actually bringing that dream to an end. So I, I I related to the guys in the dock, but sparingly. Um, as much as I wish I didn't have to kind of thing. Um, but, but again, but, but that also kind of over time, time heals all wounds, they say. And over time you kind of put that behind you because you recognize that life, life has to go on. The wonders of time and how it heals. Yes, time does heal. 41 years have passed. Life has gone on. The resilience of the Grenadian people is evident.
No. A major Caribbean figure who remained vocal and supportive of the Grenadian people was the Dominican Prime Minister, the late Dame Eugenia Charles. You would recall her appearance next to United States President Ronald Reagan in the briefing room of the White House on the morning of the intervention, October the 25th, 1983. She was a steadfast supporter and she kept a keen eye on the situation in Grenada, including the trial. A nice thing, nobody likes it, nobody likes what caused it to come up before the courts in fact. But I don't think that you can keep those people for life in a prison in, in Grenada. You would never be comfortable. What kind of effects do you see that having on the social structure of the country? I don't think it will affect. I think Grenadians have expected this to happen. I think they want it behind their back so they can forget about it. Because this, although they have tried to pick up the pieces after the trial, the long trial, and waiting for the decision. I think that they want to have this thing finished, put an end to, and be able to go forward, forgetting that this ever happened, the aberration, it's every incident itself ever happened, and the results of the incidents that ever happened, so they can begin to build the country with strength and courage. With time, the conviction moved from death to life imprisonment, and between 2006, six, seven, eight, and nine, they would have been released from prison over that time. Formed now part of the Grenadian society. With the exception of, of Bernard Cord, he opted to go back to Jamaica. Phyllis Cord was released before because she was not well. Um, she passed on about three years ago. Now, what happened there, I, my brother was the judge that eventually gave the fellows 40 years and that already spent uh, nearly 30 years in prison, okay? So then he, he said that in any court system, they take off three years each year. So when you multiply that, that's why they, they came out about two or four years afterwards, after he sentenced them. But so in a sense, the argument is that he freed them. That's why Bobby Clark was here saying why he should recuse himself and all that because he knew the fellas and all that. When I read, the whole, I read his whole judgment, and of course, he did not reverse the original condemnation of which the fellows are found guilty of murder. But there's two types of murder that are, they're found guilty of. There's the murder of the people that ordered the execution, the Central Committee members, and there's the murder by the gunmen, three soldiers that shot them. And one of them, the Bernard, said that he, he, he and at Morris Bishop, he was the body that riddled Morris Bishop's body. Then a guy that did not shoot said he went up and cut Morris Bishop's throat and then cut off his ring finger. Now, you, these are heinous crimes. Because if the, if, the, um, if the fellows have been captured, you're not supposed to execute prisoners of war. So even if it's a war going on, you're supposed to do that. So if to the extent that they were killed, and whoever killed them, I was responsible for the death, that's a heinous crime. They were tried, found guilty, they did not put them to death. And then the appeal went up to the Privy Council. And the Privy Council said, you can't, this is our natural justice, that even a man that is a murderer, he has, he has rights. And therefore these people should be told how long the sentence is. And then my brother goes in as judge and he says, okay, you all serve some in 70 years, the sentence in the, would normally be 20 years for, for a murder, a life sentence. And you all served twice 20. So I can give you 40 and you can take off your thing, the other thing. And not the came, most of them would have come out then four years after that. Right? But when you, saw, when you see the description of what happened, and to the extent that you're saying that the, 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 the case, the judicial system, is saying this is what happened, then it's a crime that was committed. And that's why a lot of the leadership in the Caribbean, the Marxist leadership in the Caribbean, they, they were of that opinion as well. The Cubans were also of that opinion. What, what was the difference was that some people then went into this thing that one is core that killed Bishop and, and two of them were fighting an ideological difference and all that. That was the propaganda. But the, the revolution was in crisis. It was breaking down. And then it came to this collapse where people carried out violence against each other. And that is one of the things about liberal democratic systems which I think we have to take into account 
in dealing with some of these questions. This is what the Canadian Revolution avoided. They did not want to go that route. I have told you all in terms of the Constitution that the liberal democratic system is a process that has evolved out of people's struggles. You don't have to worry when it comes to Britain or not. It evolved out of people's struggles. And to give a quick example of what we're talking about, I usually give this illustration in terms of how the House of Commons is set up. They have the opposition over there and the government over here. And it goes from the old days when a fellow could get up and draw his sword and do so. And he can't reach the other side. Even if he ain't angry. You gotta take two steps to get across the to, to hit the man with the sword. So so it, it, it is also why you always you don't address the man over there, you address the speaker. That that is being civilized. If the moment that you address the man over there, it, it, it's a fight starting. You call the body name, they're, they're coming for you. So you say, Mr. Speaker, you call him honorable and all kinds of things. And you know you ain't honorable. But you can't call him honorable, Mr. the honorable this in the court. You said he learned in this and I know the man's idiot. Mm -hmm. Okay? But you have to say these things because to keep order and to have civilization without that, you can get what happened. And this, this is a lesson that the revolutionary left need to learn. That as bourgeois as that is, it comes to people's experience in struggle. That when you get when you go push in a fight, you can see when a fight started. Like, I don't know if you all got children, but the, you go, I can see when I can predict when my children are ready to fight. You you hear a little bad word or a little vex word. Bugger down. Cuff gone through. Okay, so you, what you want to do is tell them, stop that. You, you tell them, stop it. Stop it from there you hear the little temper. Say, stop it. And that's what cool it down. But if you don't have nobody to say that, a man coming in a room and putting down a revolver at the table and all kind of thing, fuck, they can shoot me right before them. And I think that is, a, a, that is where we have to be human then. And say, look, this is what happened. You know how old these fellas are? 21 and all that. The Glenn, who is the colonel, I think he was 21 years old. He's a lieutenant colonel. What kind of lieutenant colonel is? You, you ever heard of lieutenant colonel? He's barbarous, red, but he's 21 years old. He's 21 years old and he's lieutenant colonel. That's what his ambassador is, 23. Ambassador to Cuba. Little boys. Right? I mean, you what you, 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 you are doing? You're a traitor. Yeah. But I imagine you use Minister of Industry, you Lieutenant Colonel and Major this and all kind of thing, all kind of rank and all that. And take go to the head, man. You know? So this is there's a human problem which we have to go through enough to say, boy, this is what this is what went wrong and it shouldn't happen. And and what they did then was horrible. They did horrible things to each other. Human beings are capable of doing horrible things to each other. And that's why we try to be civilized. Because we don't, don't we, 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 we all this advance on the animals and things. Put you in the wrong context and see how nasty you get on. You have to learn to behave yourself. So this is part of what, 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 what happened. I, I could see some of the signs of it long before. And it is like something starting to crack, you know. You, you see the crevices and you see the cracks. It's starting to lead to collapse. Persons are still alive. Um, some stories have not been told and probably will never be told. And so it's a very touchy <laughs> part of the history to talk about. But as a historian, um, we have to talk about it. We don't have a choice. I think the next generation needs to know it is their right to know what happened in Grenada's history. And that has been, for me, the push towards asking for, and not asking, but ensuring that it happened, a history text for Grenada. So we have a history text for 11 to 13 year olds on Grenada's history from start to finish with the idea that students need to know about their own history. Um, it took a while in the making, but <laughs> it's available now for, for students. And I think it's, it's necessary, and not just for Grenada, but regionally, whatever happened in a country's past. 
the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> it's only fair that the generation, the current generation, have an idea of what happened. They will make their own decisions. They would see things differently, but they also need to have some idea of the past so that they can make better and informed decisions about now and about, and about the future. Um, it's not fair to them to hide certain things because it's painful for us having gone through the process. Um, it's not something that we, we should do. The psychological effects <laughs> of these things you don't realize until much later in life. Um, during that period of the invasion, the F-16 bombers, if I hear one now, I will flip my flap because they were flying right over the house that I was living in. And the house would shake. But the sound of the bombers, I never realized how it would have affected me until President Obama was in Trinidad. And there were F-16 bombers here on the airport. I did not know. And I was happily driving down the road. And one flew over. And I slammed the brakes on my vehicle. If there was somebody behind me, they were going to hit me. And I had a 1983 flashback by the sound of that bomber. It was like, oh my God. There I was, 11 years old again, scared out of my wits that the house is about to fall down because of the sound of that, of that aircraft. And that was just my experience. So just think in terms of someone who lost a loved one. Um, there is still a lot of that psychological and emotional drama. There was no debriefing after this, this happened, whether for families, whether even for soldiers who would have gone out and fought and saw so their, their, um, their colleagues die. There was no debriefing, no nothing, no counseling, no nothing after this ended. So it's a bit understandable that we still have these strong feelings um, about that period. But at the same time, we can't not tell the story for the sake of, for the sake of our young people. Now this speaks of the resilience of the Grenadian people. Although it was a painful experience, it is part of the political history of that island and it will be shared. One of the central figures in this situation was then Deputy Prime Minister Bernard Cord, who was a major player in the engine room of the revolutionary government. Professor Wendy Grenade, who experienced the revolution and saw it as her responsibility to unravel the mystery and share with her people, she had an opportunity to sit with Bernard Cord. I sat with him in the prison and uh, it was a very moving experience because this was the first time that I was meeting him. I would have heard about him, I would have had my own impressions of the role that he played. And I sat with him and I said, tell me about yourself and tell me who you are. And he took me back to his childhood. He took me back to his years in the United States in Brandis and where his consciousness was formed in terms of being anti-apartheid, anti-imperialist, being someone who believed in social justice. So I probed him about the 1970s and the making of the revolution and the collapse of the revolution. But you ask me what I learned, Miles. I learned that wrapped up in the Grenada, in the Grenada Revolution were contradictions and possibilities, all in one place. I learned that we could never achieve a freedom through unfreedoms. If we are in fact searching for freedom, we can't find that freedom through means of unfreedoms. And what do I mean by that? Peace and justice must coexist if we are in, the, in fact to find freedom. And I think I did that interview and I had a lot of unanswered questions after. 
But I saw the human. I saw the human in Bernard Court. I saw someone who said, why didn't I just go over the fence and say, Maurice, for the years of our friendship, man to man, friend to friend, let's forget the political bureau and the central committee. Let's talk. He said, if I had done that, the course of Grenada's history would have been so different. He said on reflection, why didn't I go to the airport to meet him as I always did? And in sitting and speaking with him, I saw a human being who made serious mistakes and fatal errors and who spent 26 and more years in prison and who had an opportunity to reflect. So as, as, as we try to understand the Grenada Revolution in all its manifestations, of course, the fact is it imploded and people had to take responsibility for that. It ended in a tragic taking of lives in a very murderous way. And people have to take responsibility for that. But in the work that I do, I found that over time, 30 years, 40 years, and you had one side, and that side was demonizing the Grenada Revolution and all that happened. The other side was romanticizing it, as if nothing happened that was wrong. And I tried to make sense of the contradictions and the possibilities. What were the achievements of the Grenada Revolution? And there were many. We have the International Airport. We have a legacy of, of women involvement in politics. We have, in terms of social programs, we had the Centers for Popular Education. There were attempts at grassroots democracy to democratize the society in a more participatory way. And those things were good. But all of those things were happening at the same time that people were being incarcerated without trial and we were having human rights violations. So we can't just romanticize it as if it was all good, or we can't just demonize it as if nothing good happened. And I like to frame it by saying it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. This has been Resilience of the Spice Isle. The series continues next week at the same time. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. Thanks for your time.